Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I am honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you. And please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last week's episode with Ken Auletta, George Colt, and Susan Isaacs, or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Birds Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Birds Books hosts a reading by and conversation with Jillian LaRussa and Roger Rosenblatt. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with Crowdcast, many of you have discovered the chat to the right. Please feel free to comment throughout the evening at will. But if you have a question, look at the bottom of your screen and you'll see an Ask a Question tab. That's where I'm going to go to look for your questions to ask either of the authors this evening. The green link to this episode, the green link at the bottom of your page, is the link to the episode on Birds Book's website where you can learn more about the authors and perhaps buy one of their books. So our first speaker is Jillian LaRussa. Jillian LaRussa is a writer, educator, and artist based on Long Island. She received her MFA in Creative Writing and Literature from Stony Brook University and currently teaches English at Monroe College. Her work has appeared in the Breakwater Review. She refuses to walk if she can roller skate, in, roller skate instead and has fallen in love with every abandoned building she's seen. Welcome to the screen, Jillian LaRussa. Let me find you here, Jillian. There you go. Hi, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to be reading from a new book I've been working on. A little background for everyone. We've got our main character, Laura. She doesn't really know what she wants out of life, but knows enough that she wants everything to stay the same. She then meets a new coworker named Alyssa, and Alyssa is the opposite, set on a very fast path forward. And they come together and show one another that there are different ways to understand yourself and how you move forward. And I thought it especially poignant to read today as well, in light of the legislation that went into act in Florida, because I firmly believe as a writer, as an educator, that children cannot be what they cannot see. And I was a very imaginative, quiet child who, had I read more queer fiction, queer nonfiction, probably would have owned myself a little younger. So I have been seeking to fill that place on the shelf for other young writers and readers. I knew beyond the boarded windows lay a floor plan I could recognize with my eyes covered. I could still feel the ribbed edges of quarters I'd beg from my dad to buy little sweaty pieces of candy that softened into gum. Just past the machines lurked two aisles of fish food full of fishy stink. The shells left behind bore no such fruit now. They leaned into each other, forming triangles of dusty air and empty space. I'm sure other tall shelving units stood straight still, and some only existed as shadows bled onto filthy tiles. That's the thing with abandoned buildings. The past seeped into the present, all murky water collected from drips in the ceiling. What is this place? And I also knew from the outside, it didn't look like much. 
a one-story, nondescript building the color of cement in winter spread across a pockmarked parking lot. Once three shops, a haven of electronics, a family-run furniture place with commercials featuring three generations of leathery Long Islanders, and a pet supply store with at least two screeching birds at all times. The guy who bought it attempted to make the site one large center. It wasn't hard to do. My mother told me it was once a big box store, and if I close my eyes and think hard and small enough, I can transport myself back to my car seat. We drive past, and the blaze of a neon sign catches my little eyes, welcoming us in from the road. We don't stop in my memories. We never do. It was the start of a new M&F Mart, but then they went out of business, and now it's just here. I pointed to the rightmost edge of the parking lot, where the pavement still held over the barrage of weeds fighting through. This is where I learned to drive. I think pieces of my rims are still scraped against that curb. Well, now I'm just glad I didn't take you up on that ride you didn't offer. Alyssa laughed and it joined the chorus of her bike chain jangling as the wheels bumped over the unsteady ground. Rule number one, don't bring a car if there's no place to park. I gestured around me. At the back of the building, there were patches of scraggly foliage, but from the front, cars zoomed past. Complete exposure defined. Oh, there's rules now. There's always been rules. I've just been saying them to myself. I know, real hot girl shit. I got another laugh from Alyssa, and it felt like the bike pushing alongside my body could roll right into the air and fly. I'd let her be the Elliot to my E.T., all cozy in my red sweatsuit as she careened us towards space. Do I get a list of these rules? She tucked a strand of curly hair behind her ear, and I shook my head. Absolutely not. How else am I going to keep you on your toes and let you think you're taller? I so am. I eyeballed her, pretending to scrutinize every last inch. Her hair hit her shoulders with a bounce, accentuated on each step she took. I liked it down. I liked how soft it swirled into curls. I wanted one finger to ensnare a single piece and trap myself in its coils. I suspected she was taller. But I wanted her two inches from my face, breathing in the very air I exhaled, trying hard not to hypnotize herself with the exact shape of my cupid's bow, so I could tell. Yeah, jury's still out on this one. The jury is not out, it's very much in, and it's hearing all about my 5'8 ass. Her voice squealed into the warm air of the afternoon, startling a roost of birds in a nearby tree. I feel like you're pretty defensive for someone so tall, I remarked, moving right past the mention of her ass. I always struggled with staring, even when I was a kid. My shins were bruised with more than just kickball casualties and knee pad grooves. Many a pelt underneath the table had my name on the toe. I tried hard not to stare at Alyssa's ass, trust me, I did. It was just too good not to. I feel like you run your mouth a lot for someone so small. She stopped and turned to face me. Between us, our bikes prevented standing any closer than an arm's reach, maybe two. In her face, I saw all the delights of taunts said and not yet spoken. The sun caught her skin so it dazzled in the light, like ripples of water shining underneath the heat of mid-June. I lost all of my words in the sight of her, and without thinking, I stepped forward. The handlebars of my bike knocked into hers. Fuck. Sorry. The moment broke, and we were left with humidity in the air and an unmentioned wish of what I wanted to do. Alyssa blinked and then looked down. Tucking her hair behind her ear again, she straightened her bikes. You're good. Fuck. Why did I do that? I always pushed and wound up walking away with nothing. Not this time. I could have a hot friend, right? I didn't even know if she was into girls like that. Not that that stopped me before, but still. I paused at the back corner of the parking lot and squatted down. See that? There were a few inches of space with tangled branches arching over the grass beneath. It was just wide enough to lay down a bike. Maybe two. Leave him here. Alyssa followed my lead and slid her bike into the gap and then stood back up, wiping her palms against her bare thighs. We walked over to the back of the building, getting close enough to see the empty bottles and cans that littered the loading dock. There weren't any windows to climb through, but I knew the secrets of this place. Five steps from the hiding spot. No, not like that. And Jesse would shove me in the ribs, correcting my footwork. One shoe placed heel to toe, carefully in front of the next. At the very corner of the building, peer around, check to see if the coast is clear. Quick! I love that part. We'd duck our heads and look at the road, but she'd press one hand in between my shoulder blades for balance. If I held my breath and kept the moment still in my mind, 
I could make her reach out her arms and hold me. I do it in my sleep, puppet master of my dreams. She pulls me close and together we make sure the cops are nowhere to be found. And if I'm feeling really crazy that night, maybe she even places a kiss on my neck, right where the bony bit of my skin pokes taut. She pulls me back around and instead of disappearing into a grate that gets us into the basement storage room, she presses me against the concrete of the wall. With her arms on opposite sides of my head, the kiss she lays on my lips is hot and slow, like I've always want. Lore? I jumped and turned to look at Alyssa, who stood squinting in the sun, hands shielded over her eyes. She nodded, face neutral. Fuck. Ghosts lingered even here, even in places Jesse and I only went a few times, enough to count on a hand. So, getting in. Getting in, Alyssa repeated, staring at me expectantly. We've got to this, go to this corner here. I led the way and allowed the memory of high school games to flood out of my mind. Solo, I popped my head around the corner. No cops. Pointing, I used a nearby broken branch to shove open the ever loose grate. Down, down. It's darker than I thought it was. What was that? We, we should just stay quiet. That way we can hear. What, what was that? But actually what? No, what was that? Alyssa's earlobes practically grazed her shoulders. Her elbows pressed tight into the rib blue of her tank top, and I could see goosebumps prickle under the hair on her arms. Just, just calm down, okay? Okay? Her palm slid up and over her shorts fast, like she planned on burning a hole through the denim. I stuck my hands in the pockets of my jeans. Jeez, okay. No, me! Spinning to face me, she made an attempt to unclench. It didn't work. I didn't, I didn't think it would be, I, I would be. You've never... I didn't know how to ask her. Broken into some place before? Been in a, in a completely darkened, cold basement with only the sounds of your shoes scraping against debris and water leaking? Alyssa fiddled with her necklace. No. I stopped. Mirroring me, she paused as well, and we let the damp, cool air swirl around us. Like a cloud, it hung imperceptibly, and yet still unable to be anything but felt. I'm sure Alyssa could sense it creeping along her skin, but once she let it in, I knew she would relax. Take a big breath. Alyssa side-eyed me, doubt rich in the furrowed lines of her brow, and gave what sounded like the world's smallest inhale. The breath puffed out in a white cloud that rose to be swallowed by the darkness. Feel it. You're here. Your feet are solidly planted beneath you. Give me two things you can see. Um, that beam over there? A can? I know how much you probably want to drink some of that, but I promise you, not worth it. I get a laugh that comes short and quick and I keep on. Now me, on the other hand, grubby, bottom feeder. Don't let me out of your sight, otherwise I'm going to have a feast. Ew, stop it. Alyssa shoved me, tiny, like a leaf slapping against brick, and I watched her other arm relax against her body. I'm hungry, okay? You've got a growing beast with you. I scanned my flashlight across the basement, casting a glow on the mostly empty space. Decorated with cobwebs and loose strands of dust, the structural beam stood alone amongst broken beer bottles and forgotten, squashed cans. A tangled sweatshirt pooled in a far corner where I could just make out the knob to the door that would bring us to the stairwell. Are you okay to start moving? Alyssa nodded her head and then caught herself. You don't have to be so nice to me, you know. I laughed and then realized, she wasn't kidding. I had no idea what kind of people had been around in school or even flats. What kind of observation is that? That's like offering someone to hit you in the face if they want. I just mean, you don't even really know me. You don't really know me either. I can't remember the last time I did something like this with someone like you. I stopped short. Yes, I did. I moved away from Alyssa as if hypnotized by the cement wall and the vague grooves that made it look like brick. Maybe I was. Maybe I was just lost, trapped in the small part of some big tradition of people coming down here to lose their way into finding anything that may quiet their minds. I kept my back to Alyssa. I couldn't look at her. My lip felt dangerously loose, like one rogue wobble could send me into hysterics. I got named most likely to become principal in high school. My finger faltered in the cement, and I curled it back to scratch my nail against the inside of my thumb. Yeah, pretty stupid, right? Not even like a whole pick out of a hat thing. I got nominated. There were votes on a shitty school-wide website. Alyssa's voice wafted from behind me. 
It was like she was all around, filling the space completely, snuffing out the memory of Jesse that had begun, again, to creep in at the edges. I had to accept a trophy in front of my entire class. And the worst thing? The principal was so proud. Like, so proud. He gave me the squeeze on my shoulders when I got my diploma like he remembered, too. He probably did. He definitely did. I felt like I wanted to melt right into the floor. Who gets called the next principal? That's ice cold. I turned my shoulder slightly. Out of my peripherals, I could make out Alyssa tracing a shape in the dirty floor with the toe of her chunky sneaker. From the soft sway of her leg, it didn't seem like our conversation held even half of her concentration. I followed the path on the ground. Left. Right. Return. I never did anything bad. Never ditched school. Never cut class. I put my head down, and I did the right thing, and I got into a good school, and here I am future principal, still. The sneaker paused, then arced wider. Dirt sprayed like water beaming from a hose. And I'm so fucking bored, she moaned, extending the word to carry through the basement with the heft of a curse. At least you're not boring. Alyssa looked up and met my eyes. Hers were big and to my surprise, wet. We stared, locked in a game of crying chicken. Yeah? I nodded, and she bent her head, blinking. Outside, I could hear the gate scrape against the ground from a gust of wind. For what it's worth, I mean, at the very least, I consider this the opposite of boring. I don't think you are either. Hands out, she gestured around her. I chewed the inside of my lip, still far enough away from her not to catch doubt in my face. Routine clutched at my arms, invisible strings that tied me to the compliance of my day-to-day. She didn't know I biked an extra 10 miles before we met up. Could barely do without my run. I would have to disagree with you on that one. Silence followed. I like that about Alyssa. She gave me the room to fill in the gaps with a response, if I wanted to. I had a feeling I could say nothing and that would be okay too. Without speaking, we both walked over to the only door in the empty basement and squeezed into the stairwell from the small opening left by rotting hinges permanently held to a forgotten ajar. Inside my head, thoughts collected, stacking on top of one another in a dazzlingly tall, precariously wobbly tower. Would speaking them alive be akin to knocking the whole damn thing over? Would I lose myself? I like things to be neat, I said suddenly. So suddenly, it almost felt like I couldn't find the moment before I was talking. Wasn't I always sharing myself with someone else? Not like organization. Well, I mean, I'm not a slob. I I'm not a clean freak. You, I don't know, you know? I looked at Alyssa and saw her nodding as she took the steps up to the ground floor alongside me. I think. Neat like easy? I clapped my palms together. Exactly. Same work schedule, same free time, same people, newness only if I have to. Neat. Easy. See, now I disagree. Yeah? Yeah, or maybe I don't know how you have to define doing something. Because you didn't have to go to that party, and you didn't have to hang out with me. I rolled my eyes. Not this again. Alyssa held up her hands, and I let her finish. I know, we've been there. But I think you secretly like newness. I think, deep down, you like the things that scare you. How do you figure? Pointing ahead at the also open door to the main level, Alyssa smiled. I get it, you're a pro, but we don't know what's out there. Could be anything. Could be snakes. Of all things. Snakes? Yeah, Long Island snakes. Infamous things. They like old buildings and terrified bisexuals and all-knowing assistant managers with a love for routine. I grinned. Fully. Finally. And it wasn't like the Jenga blocks in my brain fell down or disappeared or anything miraculous. They shifted and flew around and spread out into a single layer on some imaginary ground. Over them, I must cross. Well, it's a good thing for you, then, that I happen to have received my sa snake safety training certificate. Alyssa peered out, I squinted, and I stepped next to her. Good. Keep me safe. We turned to face each other. I promise. It seemed as though we'd found ourselves in another perfect moment until, fately from behind us, a radio squawked. Time crackled in chorus, and I slowly lifted my finger to my lips. 
Alyssa's chest rose and fell in a rapid dance, and before she could turn her panicked face to the stairwell, I grabbed her hand and pulled her into the main room. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jillian. Our second speaker is Roger Rosenblatt. Roger Rosenblatt is an American memoirist, essayist, and novelist. Before turning to literary work, he held the Briggs Copeland appointment in teaching at, of writing at Harvard, where he earned his PhD. Currently the distinguished professor of English and writing at Stony Brook University. He is the author of five New York Times notable books of the year, four bestsellers, including Making Toast on the Death of His Daughter, first published as an essay in The New Yorker. His essays for Time and PBS have won two George Polk Awards, the Peabody and the Emmy. Among his honors are a Fulbright Scholarship, seven honorary doctorates, the President's Medal from the Chautauqua Institution, and the Kenyon Review Award for a Lifetime Literary Achievement. In 2021, he founded Write America. Please welcome to the screen, Roger Rosenblatt. Thank you, Alice, and thank you, Jillian whose work I've known for quite a while, and I didn't think there was anything left to admire, and how well she reads, how well you read, Jillian. A real drama. I will read two things, uh, one funny and one serious, and I hope you'll be able to tell the difference. First piece is called May I Kill You. And what do you do? I'm a writer. May I kill you? I'm sorry. And what do you do? I'm a writer. May I kill you? What do you write, if you don't mind my asking? I do mind. May I kill you? Would I have read anything you wrote? No, no one has. May I kill you? That last novel of yours, what was it about? Nothing. Nothing may I... C and yet, it showed promise. Or am I thinking of another writer? You are. I'm a novelist, too, you know. I wonder if I could send you my manuscript. Of course. Please do send me your manuscript, but not by snail mail. Send it FedEx so that I can have it sooner. You know, I was remarking to my pet bat, Arthur, just the other night. I said, Arthur, I wish to God someone, anyone would send me his manuscript or hers. I'd like to read the manuscripts in North America first, then extend my purview to the Baltic States and Indonesia, where I understand there are many more manuscripts. Are you okay? You're sounding overwrought, kind of manic, but I guess all writers are wound a bit tight. Yes, we are. May I kill you? I must tell you, this piece of yours is great, but it's not for us. Who is it for, do you think? Can't say. It's just not for us. Maybe it's not for anyone. What do you think? I don't know. But I do know it's not for us. On the other hand, we really loved it, and we want to publish it as soon as possible. You do? Absolutely. Only the first 100 pages, they have to go. But the book is, a is only 104 pages long. Is it? Ever. We loved it. What's wrong with the first 100 pages? Nothing major. We can't tell who the main character is, and we don't know what the story is about, and we wouldn't be interested if we did. You see what I mean? Absolutely. I could not agree more. I worked on the novel only six years, give or take, to pass the time. I knew it was shit, but you know how bored one gets? It was, it was just something to do. We understand perfectly. Would you like to kill us? Would I? But not, not quickly. Crush your tongue in a vice, pluck out your eyes with sherbet scoops, sear your ass with a, a soldering iron. That's the way I'd like to do it. I love your work. You love my work? It reminds me of Proust. It does? Have you ever read Proust? No, no one has. No one has ever read Proust. It's just something to say. So you really don't like my work? No, but I love Proust. Me too. May I kill you? Know what I love best about your work? It's neorealism, that's what. And it's neoplatonism too. And it's neologisms, they're the tops. And I also love its lapidary style, its catachresis. Everything, actually. The entire oeuvre. Are you from the New York Review of Books? Who isn't? What did your review say about my novel? I forget. We called it lurid, yet redeeming. Ah, yes. We also called it lacking in style and content, yet brave. Personally, I don't think I've ever read a braver novel, how it fought off those other novels. Oh, see what I've done. 
I've hurt your feelings. Look, the trouble with you writers is you're too touchy, too, how shall I put it, needy. Why not say needy? Needy, yes. All you ever want is praise, praise, and more praise. And when you don't get it, you get all steamed up and pissed off and you seek revenge, revenge against us. You want to kill us, other people. Why, you don't even think about other people unless, of course, we're praising you. Any other time, we're useless. Get real, will you? No one receives praise. That's the way of the world. When the guy gives you change at the 7-Eleven, do you tell him, hey, man, great change? Planet Earth, me bucko, your, vo your work may be brilliant or it may stink, and no one will ever know who you are, and you'll die, and people will discover your unpublished stuff posthumously and say it stinks too. Why should you care? That's not why you write. You write to do it. Isn't that so? Do you mean that? Certainly I mean it. You think we writers are destructively self-involved? Duh. Well, I must say, I never thought of it from your point of view, and what you say makes sense. I don't write for you, any of you. I write for me. Yes, this conversation has been a real eye-opener. Thanks. Thanks very much. Just one more question. The second piece is the beginning of a new book called Cataract Blues involves certain things, but it's centrally about what is invisible and inaudible in the world, the power of what is not seen and what is not heard. And I mix it in with the cataract operation, which I've had recently, and the stunning effect of the color blue as a result of being able to see clearly. But the main part of the book is our daughter, who died 15 years ago and is also inaudible and invisible and a power in the world and a presence in our life. So, cataract blues. The human eye has more rods, that is, cells for, used for the perception of light, located at the outer edges of the retina, which allows us to see certain things more clearly out of the corners of our eyes. Colors, on the other hand, are perceived by cones at the center of the eye. In my odd way of seeing things, this means that my recent enthrallment with the color blue is the direct product of looking straight ahead, whereas the music of the blues played at the far sides of my mind go on. One is front and center, the other a ghost in the wings. When I see, when I see blue and feel blue, I'm using my whole eye. Charles Cole, my cataract surgeon, travels the world using his skills in the neediest places. In Africa, he tells me, the cataracts are so thick they form a black shield over the eyes. Villagers who suffer cataracts are legally blind and need to be led around by sighted people who hold one end of a stick as the blind person holds the other. In the villages where Dr. Cole has worked his magic, there are piles of discarded sticks. These piles of sticks become accidental monuments that may remind villagers of the time so many of them were helpless and helpful to one another. Such transactions speak for the beautiful gestures people are occasionally capable of. The blind man at the short end of the stick had to imagine everything around him, though the help he was given was real. He even imagined the, the appearance of his helper. By necessity, he saw inward where the vistas are illimitable. He was helpless, but he saw. Once cured and seeing, what did he think every day when he passed the village piles of sticks? Relief and gratitude only? Wonder at Western science? Or a pang of longing? Attempting to account for the fact that the ancient Irish soldiers lost every battle they got into, the poet Seamus O'Shiel posited it was a secret music the soldiers heard, a sad, sweet plea for pity and for peace that distracted them from the fighting at hand. And so they lost, said O'Shiel, not because they lacked skill, strategy, stamina, courage, or weapons, but rather because they were sensitive to a spiritual sound, a tune that beckoned them like muted sirens toward an inner peace by which they simultaneously were elevated and doomed. I doubt that such receptivity comes naturally. One must cultivate an inner stillness capable of picking up unplayed notes, the nothing that is there, 
as Wallace Stevens said of snow. First there is nothing, then the nothing becomes everything. The Irish warriors surrendered not to the enemy, but to the mystery. Something will come to you, Richard Wilbur's assurance in waking to sleep. Like a queen who expects her chair to be there when she wishes to sit, like a general scouting the enemy who expects a pair of binoculars to be placed in his hands when he needs them, something essential will come to you without being summoned. I tell that to my writing students when they bemoan dry spells, they don't believe it, and then they do. There are sticks out there waiting to be held by two. There's a secret music out there waiting to sweep through you like a jazz riff. Trust me, trust it, something will come to you. I got a right to sing the blues. I have to write to swing the blues. I have the sight to see the blues. Blue, the color blue. Once Dr. Cole removed my cataracts, there remained what was called a foreign object in my right eye. Soon it was gone. The color blue came busting into my life like an Atlantic City stripper, brassy, noisy, hey, big spender. Call me, Mr. Blue. Oh, say, can you see nothing? In the traditional Chinese, in traditional Chinese architecture, dugong is a structural element of interlocking wooden brackets. The pieces are fitted together by joinery alone without nails, glue, or fasteners. In the early dynasties, vast palaces and temples were built this way. To look at them, one would never know that dugong was supporting the structure because the arrangement of the wooden pieces depends on the absence of visible, tangible adhesive elements. In other words, the dugong represents the there that is not there. What we will not acknowledge as there might not be there, yet we always know something is there. For the essence of invisibility is something present, <coughs> excuse me, something present that cannot or will not be seen, not something not there. Absence requires presence. Remember the tune, all or nothing at all, all or nothing at all or offers a choice of two somethings. Sing it. More like a presence than an injury now after all these years, the presence of absence. Death changes the dead too. Imagine that. What the African villager sees, what the Irish soldier hears, like that, more like that. The pain transmogrifies from a cracked bone to a light. A song. She had her own songs, many children do. Hers was hers was fort, was fortified by her insistence that her lyrics were real words, no matter how unusual they sounded. In the car, she would sing, A rock and roll boat is a way boat. When we asked her what a way boat was, she said it was a wave boat. When we asked her what a wave boat was, she turned away, annoyed, and looked out the car window. Her pediatrician, John Roby, was referred to as Rock and Roll Roby. When warm weather arrived, she sang, A summer day is a comer day. We knew better than to press her on the meaning of a comer day, so a summer day was a comer day. Sometimes she exercised poetic license. Passing fields of a few grazing cows, then a few more, she squealed and shouted with excitement, Cows, billions of them. Sometimes it flares, sometimes it smolders, as in a kiln, as in a mood, mood, indigo, indigo, blue, blue coals and orange fires. It always starts with a mote in the eye, one of those foreign objects. This one's domestic. There is an ache, then it passes. The recollection, the recollection of a hat, the first pair of shoes, dank joists in a silo, a matinee, a foot race, horses, a phrase or two or ten. A summer day is a comer day. Then it passes. The pupil dilates on the eye chart. What is the smallest letter you can read? A. And a tear wet face articulated by a moon ray on a snowfield in Vermont. Too cold, daddy. Little girl blue. Head up, look up. Head back, look up, look down, wide open. And then that's gone too. Along with a figment of a security blanket, a liquid laugh, red boots, 
cartwheels in Logan Airport, and cows, billions of them. Blink once. This may sting a little. Thank you. There's it's my an student. Honor to with you. It is. It is my honor. The one one reason that I I, I could I could sort of rig this reading uh, with uh, Jillian Larusso is Jillian was my student in two uh, in two classes and um, and since then has become my friend. But uh, I so admired her that I wanted to talk something that we haven't really done here on Right America to talk about the relationship of a teacher and a student and how blessed a teacher is to find a student so good, not just good as a writer, which she, as you could see, as you could hear, um, uh, is self-evident, but with the way Jillian was with her fellow students, how gentle and yet severe, how important she was to them. I could see the other students turn to her and she would never treat this as a kind of regal uh, uh, anointing. Uh, she taught. She saw it as colleagues, as friends. It was wonderful for it, wonderful for a teacher to be able to see this and to see a teacher a morning. So she, because you teach now, yes. Yep. How do you like I, it? I've been enjoying it. It was different than TAing at Stony Brook, but. This is a school without a proper English department, so it's really nice to get the more resistant writers and pull it out of them and see it start to emerge in their writing. This semester I'm virtual, last semester I wasn't, so it's completely different worlds, but it always excites me to see the new batch. How bad. What did you say about an English department? They don't have a, what, what, what kind of English Yeah, department? I'm a part of the gen ed department. I see. Yep. There are certain advantages to not having a proper English department, you know. <laughs> that is true. I have not with the psychology professors. That might be better. I can't tell them too many secrets. No. no uh, start and and nothing, nothing in the university is trustworthy anyway. Just watch yourself. The, the book you're working on, how far along are you? I'm not very far in. I have unfortunately spent too much time being blocked, but... I came around at a different angle to my writing because I was putting pressure on myself to meet deadlines with working deadlines that I had enacted for myself. And so instead I, I backed up and I just tried to get to know my setting a little better. I tried mm -hmm. to get to know my characters better, come at my characters from a different direction. So now I'm maybe 45 pages in. You, where will you go from here? You had you you took us into this wonderful dark place, mm -hmm. a physically dark place, um, which was terrific because it's it, it it corresponded to the questions that you were asking yourself about her and you. Um, it, uh, it was a little scary, but also promising. Now, where do you go from here? From here, this is the moment where I find these two girls really connect because they feel so different but here in this building they're the same they're running away together so from here building upon their relationship and trying to wrestle with the idea of we heal ourselves people don't heal people so i want to make sure i'm treading lightly in that department but they're going to keep exploring their unsafe places together very good very good. Um, as I said uh, before, I started to read myself. The uh, uh, I had never heard you read dramatically before, um, and you're really good. Uh, I don't I don't know if you've acted before, but but I've acted a little bit. Um, Thank you. If nothing else, the strength that you've got in readings and public readings is going to shine. It's going to be wonderful. Well, I'll reveal the secret to everyone watching, but um, I haven't worn my retainer ever that I was supposed to. <laughs> so I've developed um, a whistle between my teeth sometimes. And <laughs> unfortunately, it has gotten sharper. And I was really trying not to hit it. <laughs> <laughs> well, your, your confession is safe with this group. They'll I figured, be talking I about figured it. it's a bunch of people to, to reveal it to. I'm sure. Um. 
What I was really it? struck with in your reading, I think okay. it actually overlapped into mine as well, when you said the there that is not there. I mean, first, yeah. a sentence that folds into itself. I just, I believe in it. Um, uh, I believe that there are uh, forces in the world, just as the Irish soldiers didn't hear the music, just as the African villagers had to depend on the there that wasn't there, that um, these are the, these are the uh, mysterious but interesting powers of our lives. Some people attach it to God. Some people uh, don't make such attachments at all and just feel that there is something in the universe that um, it's almost rescuing by these, these things that you, uh, I mean, look, what did the Irish soldiers get out of not winning the battles? They were knocked off. Um, the, uh, the, they, they won nothing and they lost their lives in most cases, but they heard a secret music that taught them pity and peace. And such things were more valuable in the long run would be, we would agree more valuable than, uh, than the ability to win one more battle in one more war. Yeah, I think it's just beautiful to know that some people maybe are more in tune with the pulse of the universe and they can use it to their advantage mm. and yeah. make it sound as beautiful as it is. Yeah, I mean, you, the uh, so much happens that is crippling in life. Uh, so much is um, uh, unbearable. So then you think, well, is it really unbearable or is there something that you uh, can understand? Is there, an understand? is there an understanding available to make it bearable? Mm -hmm. uh, not only bearable, but useful. Not only useful, but generous and something that uh, you can not only use yourself, but make use of for others. And then you suddenly start to become a different person, a more interesting person. Uh, you're just you're uh, uh, when we're talking about writers doing this uh it is uh it's essential it's one right america exists for the quality the wonderful quality of all the right america writers including uh prominently yourself uh to um say something good to the world and about the world even if we come about it through an alley and and some place some dark place and some uh, and some deep sadness. In the long run, um, people will uh, find themselves worthwhile and worthwhile for one another, as you clearly did and uh, showed us in that beautiful passage that you read. Thank you. Two people coming together. That was it, right? Yep. <laughs> That's the, it's not really, it's not terribly complicated, you know. Yeah. The, um, the, the impediments get in the way. I mean, you, you think how uh, we th this little venture of ours was founded in, a, in order to deal with the divisions in the country. Okay, we do our best. Um, it's to be sure uh, we are a small group doing our thing, and it's uh, and it's quiet, but it has. Uh, we hope it has its effect. And you think, well, is this really necessary? And then you see Mitch McConnell voting against the. Uh, uh, um, Ms. Jackson, um, the impeccable candidate, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with her. It's all right with her. She's great. Apart from being the first black uh, uh, female justice, she's just super great and undeniable. Okay. So then you think, what is this guy doing? He's getting up there and he's, and he's saying she's too far left. Well, I, I uh, lives as many years as Mitch McConnell and I, and he knows what the far left is if he's worried about it. This woman is just, just good, good, smart, decent, honest. Uh, and he knows it. He cannot help, and he's not a stupid uh, guy. So he's only playing for how, how can we make the country more uncomfortable than it is? Exactly. Kind of, mm -hmm. kind of challenges that. He must've seen something different in the footage that he watched than I watched because I think she held herself with such composure. It's a lock. It should be a lock, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and and if the times were, were right and we all had our druthers, the whole Congress would rise and, and clap and say, you're in. Well, maybe that's a digression now. So uh, you're working on this, this wonderful book. Um, and I... Uh, 
uh, I know your work from before. How is this different from what you did for me? So first off, it was, it's, it's fiction. And I came into the program and I was set on nonfiction and I wrote my memoir and I was what I needed to write. And one of the, my favorite lessons that I've got out of the program was, you know, write the book that you can finish. And that was the book I could finish the memoir. And I knew I had this story in me. And so another lesson I take from you, writers only have one story in them and they write it a hundred different ways. And that is me with my abandoned buildings. I love that. I, do, I love that. I always thought that your affection for abandoned buildings extended to me. But the, <laughs> the, 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 the whole idea, the whole idea, I know, I, know I, I drive people nuts with this thought. We have one story in us, thus one course. I don't, were you in the course of the story I am? There yes. Was the, yeah, okay. So the story I am, the premise is there's one story that you are. And I can prove it. Uh, I can I can prove it with you and I can prove it with James Joyce. Then I can start with uh, Portrait of the Artist and wind up with Crazy Finnegan and still prove it. Uh, the, the, that uh, uh, there is one story we have to tell. And for good writers like Gillian LaRusso, for really good writers like Gillian LaRusso, um, everything becomes a honing and a polishing and a working and, a, and more than that, an understanding of that story. It's not that we understand the story we are right away. We just know what story it is, uh, basically. And then we get into it deeper and deeper. The, there are wonderful writers watching you and me now from uh, Write America. Every one of them told one story and gloriously, gloriously. Absolutely. I actually think a bit of your work, again, we, we unconsciously linked our works today because I hear accidental monuments and those are my abandoned buildings. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I loved reading your thesis and I remember, was there poetry in your thesis? I dabbled a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. I liked it. I'm teaching a course next term called Prose Poem in which I take, I, you were in my mind because I remember the rhythms and that yeah. the beauty of writing, and this, this is a form um, not simply for a thesis, but it's a form to which you may return after the novel. The, the idea that you want to break it up with the music it's like jazz um, you want you're, you're, you're doing you're doing one riff you stop uh, and you think and suddenly it sounds like a popular tune and you're playing playing that for a while and then you stop and then it starts in a different kind of and starts in a minor key and then it moves to a major key then you make a mistake then you catch up with your mistake all of it done in that uh, in that form um, you did it uh, Lindsay Atkins, our cherished uh, uh, director of uh, Right America, did a beauty of a thesis, same way. Um, Claudia uh, Acevedo uh, did it. Uh, Laura Tucker uh, 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 working on something that uh, will do it. Um, and the it's in a sense, you know, you're walking along, talking prose, and then you feel like singing. So you sing for a while, and then you come back. And there could be such beauty in even a sentence itself that exactly. to focus on the musicality to make your prose push that boundary all genres blended nice. so it, it works beautifully nice do you have students that you are uh, as proud of as i am of you do you have students you particularly uh, admire i have i have one this semester he needs a little extra help he usually hangs after class and we chat but my students have a lot more hardships than I've personally ever encountered. So I give as much empathy as I can, but this student in particular is really persevering and I feel for him in so many ways, but he has done the work of opening a line of communication and that's all I can ask for in a student. So yeah, I think walking away from this semester, I'll, I really will always remember him. You were born to this. What is the nature of the difficulty? Not for him, but for you said generally they have a harder time. Um, well, they're coming from lower income areas. Their schooling wasn't great. Reminds me a lot of um, Frank McCourt. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I see a lot of my students. And so they really have fought to come to college when college may not have been an option. Right. So you take things a little slower and you work with them a little harder because they really do deserve the time. 
do they want to become writers? Um, not necessarily, but I think I can get a few to write in their free time. And that's all I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's, it's just right. Um, and uh, on this thing that I read now, uh, I, I have a good start on, uh, on it, but, um, you know, it's funny and you will find this if you haven't found it already. I rely on my friends and my colleagues, um, particularly when my, when I run up against a, a wall and, um, uh, I was reading this before and I was, the main problem was I've already written about Amy in, uh, my Amy in, uh, our Amy in, uh, uh, kayak morning. Uh, that was a book about agony. I don't want to do that now. I want to do something different. I want to indicate that death has changed things. You know, I said, I said somewhere in there that even death changes, you know, um, and who do I get that from my dear friend, Luann Walker? And how, why do I get it from Luann Walker? Cause I come to her with a problem. I said, I, this is not right. You know, there's something a little wrong in here. And then she answers the question, Robert, uh, Lopez, I'm going to ask, uh, 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 certain things, uh, too. Um, the, uh, they can't, you know, they can't write it for you. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want them to write it for you, but people who of great sensibility and intelligence can be enormous help to you. You know, um, uh, what do you do know? They, they open up your mind. They show you perspective. It, it's always great to have a writerly sounding board. Just Which right. Is why a group like this is so essential. Yeah, um, we. I think so. Couldn't be happier that you're part of it. Hello, Alice. Hello, Roger. Hello, Jillian. I do have a question for you from uh, George Colt and Ann Fadiman. Roger, you said that with patience, writers block abates. Jillian, you dealt with your own block by actively moving your perspective and looking at your narrative from new angles. For each of you, would the other strategy work for you? That's so interesting. Um, and George and Anne are just marvels and uh, listening as creatively as they do. Um, I guess uh, if you are uh, shifting uh, from one ground to another, it's another way of saying it'll come to you. What comes to you is the idea of shifting from one ground to another. There's always something that comes to you. I am persuaded of this. I used to tell Jillian and uh, the other students, if you have something, if you're blocked, if you're, if you're stymied, do not knock your head against the wall, go out for a run, get, in, get into a kayak, get, in a, get on your bike, do something and let, let, let's see what comes to you. And something comes to you. It's usually an image, but something comes to you. What do you think, Jillian? I agree. Um, I usually, when I'm painting, if I'm stuck on my painting, I, put it somewhere where it's in my way that I keep encountering it, regardless <laughs> of what my perspective is. I keep staring at it in some way and I'm thinking about it. But yeah, patience does help, but it's exactly like Roger says, you have to, you can't just sit and wait. You have to be active in some manner because everything is out there in the zeitgeist. You just have to last it on back to you. It may, sometimes it, when writers talk this way, it can be irritating. People think, well, you're so specially anointed that you uh, get these words and, and automatic writing that Yates used to irritate people with and all that stuff. I guess it can be irritating, but it's true. Something does come to you. And uh, not just to writers. Um, the uh, It comes to composers. It comes to painters. Um, we're in the business of being inspired, being breathed into, as the Latin uh, as of inspire uh, suggests. Um, and it doesn't mean we are more important or more unblessed. It's certainly not more divine than a carpenter or a plumber, but we do what we do. Um, a question that I have for you, because I like to circle back to access to reading materials. Are there any up and coming authors that you know of that you don't think that we might have heard of that you want to share? I know you always ask this question, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Jen, Jillian uh, answer it, and I'll see if I can think of someone. Okay, so it's not, usually it's not homework. <laughs> <laughs> usually, I'm not a big fiction reader, but because I'm writing fiction now, I figured I should read some, and so I recently read *Boys of Alabama* by Genevieve Hudson, 
And that came out back in 2020, but I really enjoyed this close examination of a fish out of water story that felt really present. It was based in the deep South, but then there was this surprise of magical realism. And right, I suppose yeah. I should have looked more closely at the cover because the cover did let me know that, but I was surprised. <laughs> and I, I love being surprised. Well, welcome to the world of fiction. It's a new adventure for you. Yeah. I guess my mind is still focused on what we've got. We have some treasures among us. Uh, Sushita Nair is one uh, here. And Cornelia Channing is another. And Amy Cachola is yet a third. And I mentioned Laura uh, Tucker before. And there are many more um, uh, students. Uh, uh, I've got uh, I got a wonderful student in the current class, uh, Joe Weiner, who's a doctor. He knows something. It's so wonderful to know something and then be a writer as well. You know, um, so... Uh, I guess it's a lot of an indirect answer to your question. They are emerging. You haven't just seen them emerge yet. I also think your curation of Write America brings in so many emerging writers. I just wanted to know if there was a little tidbit out there we needed to know about. Um, what are you each reading now? What do you currently have if you're reading? <laughs> <laughs> or just writing? Well, well, readers read. <laughs> yeah, we do read. Right now, I got my hands on Open Me Carefully. It's Emily Dickinson's letters oh, to nice. Susan Huntington Dickinson. And very much enjoying that. I'm completely destroying it with all my notes in it. And I'm even more excited about that. What I'm reading is so weird uh, that uh, although my friends and students will say, not weird for you, Roger. I'm reading Lycidas and Adonais and uh, Auden's Elegy to Yeats. Why are you reading this, Roger? Because I'm exploring the, the concept of admiration as a motive for writing. And the, all the, the reason these elegies are so wonderful is that somebody has said, your life mattered. I loved you in your life. I miss you. All of that, which of course feeds into what I'm writing myself, which is why I'm reading it. But I wanted to read them again. Lycidas, Adonais, uh, and the elegy to uh, and the elegy to Yeats, um, as I say, admiration is a wonderful motive for a writer. Well, on that note, we have run out of time, and I don't want to run out of time. It's been a genuine pleasure to have both of you here. So I have to sign off now. But thank you each. I mean, this has been the perfect episode for Write America, the inspiration, and. I feel full. So thank you very much. Um, and I will sign off. I'd like to thank Jillian and Roger for participating in Write America this evening. And to each of you who tuned in tonight. And thank you, Roger, for creating this original and important series to look forward to each and every Monday evening. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write America. We hope to see you all next Monday at 7 as we welcome Carmen Jimenez and Dan Halperin. Please remember to check out Bird's Book's Write America page where you can sign up for upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. Thank you for joining us. Good night.